All right, let's begin. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our second installment of um, how to implement trauma-informed care practices. Um, this training is being brought to you all by African Americans Reach and Teach Health Ministry um, in collaboration with the Mountain um, West AIDS Education and Training Center. And so I will not wait any longer. I will introduce our um, our speaker, Dr. Michelle Andresic, uh, who is a clinical health psychologist and is the lead behavioral scientist for the Fred Hutchinson-based HIV Trials Network. Um, she's a senior staff scientist um, at Fred Hutchinson Vaccine and Infections Infectious Disease Division and an affiliate assistant professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. Dr. Andresic received her PhD in clinical health psychology from the University of Miami. She also has a master's degree in health education and psychological counseling from Columbia University. Dr. Andresic is highly committed to developing collaborative relationships between researchers and community members and brings extensive expertise utilizing community-based participatory research, qualitative research methods, and working with communities and community organizations, both as a researcher and as a service provider. Prior to her doctoral training, Dr. Andresic was the Director of AIDS Services for a community-based HIV service organization with offices in New York City, in the boroughs of Brooklyn and Manhattan. So as you can see, she has a very extensive um, resume. And um, without further ado, um, Michelle, would you like to um, begin? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. So let me um, get the slideshow going here. So as, as you all know, we are going to be talking about implementing trauma-informed care practices and given what is going on around us and that many of us are involved in. I think that um, although this topic is timely at any time, uh, with what is going on now, it seems to be even more timely. Um, for the next hour and a half, I'm going to leave plenty of time for a Q&A and happy for people to interrupt during uh, the presentation uh, if you have questions as well. Um, but for the um, presentation itself, I'm going to define some terms that are um, typically used when discussing trauma so that we can all be on the same page. I think in any discussion of trauma-informed care, uh, a, a very, very good understanding of how trauma can be passed down over generations and how people can be traumatized and re-traumatized by um, some of the practices that we have not only in medical facilities, but in some of um, our community-based um, organizations as well. I'll talk a, a lot about resilience and what we know about some of the factors that can uh, be beneficial and potentially assist individuals as they um, cope with some of the traumas uh, that they've experienced in their lives. And then finally, we are going to have a very brief overview of some of the methods that you can utilize to incorporate trauma-informed care practices into your work. And you know, I'll be providing you with a, um, a few resources to help you move along in that direction. 
So before we begin to talk about trauma, I think it's really important to understand what trauma is. And honestly, the best resource that I have found um, with regard to trauma and trauma-informed care are the resources that have been developed by SAMHSA. And you can go to their site. I have it there at the bottom of this page and get a wealth of information about trauma. And they have um, a workbook on incorporating trauma-informed care into your practices, which is really, really incredible. So uh, definitely utilize that resource. Um, but to get us started here, trauma is basically uh, something that results from either an event or a series of events, or it could be a set of circumstances. And I think that's really key because most of us, when we think about trauma, we think of it as an event or a set of events. But for many, it's the circumstances that they were born into um, or that they find themselves in after um, losing a job or after having exorbitant medical bills, for example. And these events or circumstances are experienced by the individual, could also be experienced by the family or the larger community, as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And these experiences have lasting adverse effects. And I think that is key. And we'll talk about what that looks like. Um, and these adverse effects not only impact a person's mental health, but they impact a person's overall functioning. So their physical health, their social, emotional, spiritual well being, as well as mental health. So I think, you know, that is a really key component of trauma as well that it can impact the whole individual and the, the individual's functioning, as well as the family functioning and the co larger community functioning. And those are the things that we often don't talk about in discourses uh, around trauma. So it's really important, I think, to understand a few terms, um, one being misogyny, uh, because of uh, the pervasive misogyny that we see not only in this culture, but in other cultures, um, there is a devaluing of the identity of female or woman. And because of that, in many communities and the larger society, we see an epidemic of violence against women. And, um, you know, for many women, violence and victimization is uh, a normal part of their reality. And um, as such, uh, many women have trauma uh, in their lives uh, at the hands of an abuser. Um, intersectional, and I, excuse me, intersectionality is another term that I'll be referring to. And intersectionality is basically uh, the intersection of devalued identities. So one of those devalued identities can be, uh, you know, your gender, can be your race, class, uh, your sexual orientation, um, your gender identity, uh, it could be uh, your age, uh, your ability level, and so forth. And I think it's really important to understand that this intersection of um, devalued identities exponentially increases um, the risk for trauma or traumatic events across individuals. So if you are a woman, you have one devalued identity, but if you are a black woman, then you have two devalued identities. If you are a black transgender woman, then you have three, devalued identities and you know so on and so on and the more devalued identities an individual has the more likely they are to come in contact with situation or situations that could be potentially traumatic it's also important to understand microaggressions uh, often people with devalued identities receive daily messages and experience daily behaviors 
that serve to invalidate or um, negate their identity. And um, it doesn't matter whether or not these messages or behaviors that they experience are intentional or unintentional. There's a whole body of research that shows that these messages and behaviors that communicate hostility, that communicate negative slights, insults that are derogatory, that devalue individuals, have the exact same impact on that person's well-being regardless of whether they're intentional or unintentional. And I'll be talking about microaggressions um, in more detail a little later. So if you're not clear about what those are, you will be by the end of this session. And then also I think it's important to understand, to have a basic understanding of historical trauma. It also has been called transgenerational or intergenerational trauma. And this is basically um, a set of events that was perpetrated against a group of people who share a specific identity. So it could be transgender individuals, uh, could be native individuals, black, Jewish. Um, and these events were perpetrated with genocidal or ethnocidal intent. So, and what it results in is the annihilation or disruption to an entire community's way of life, their culture, and their identity. And I'll talk more about uh, historical trauma as well, but just want to lay the foundation so that everyone knows these terms. And then I'll also be talking a lot about medical trauma. And medical trauma is basically abusive provider behavior. And again, whether it's intentional or not, has the same impact. And it could not only uh, include the behavior of a provider, but also medical procedures, um, invasive or frightening treatment experiences, and all of these things, again, result in negative psychological or physiological responses. And it could be from a specific patient or their family and or their larger community. So I wanted to just give a brief overview of some experiences that are potentially traumatic. And uh, I include um, intimate partner or domestic violence here at the very top because of how epidemic it is in our culture. And um, it often does not receive um, attention. So, um, you know, many individuals are born into situations where there is violence and violence is, um, is normative. And this could be not only physical violence, but sexual violence, emotional, psychological violence, financial abuse. You know, there's a whole umbrella of um, violence uh, that uh, falls under sort of this intimate partner uh, domestic violence um, category. Also, uh, separate from that is sexual abuse or assault that may not happen at the hands of a partner. Physical abuse or assault, again, that may not be at the hands of um, a partner. Any emotional abuse or psychological maltreatment, uh, neglect, and the, the list goes on and on. But these are um, the most common um, experiences uh, that result in trauma. Um, if you look at the population as a whole. And there are certainly things that are not included in here, but this is just to give you a general sense of those experiences that are more common across the general populace. And I think it's important to realize that trauma can occur throughout the lifetime. And what often happens, particularly for people who have uh, marginalized or devalued identities is that this trauma first occurs in early childhood. And as I mentioned before, some people are born into traumatic situations. And so, um, you know, it may be normalized for individuals who are in abusive 
um, homes or um, homes wherein there's neglect or so forth. So it's really, really critical to think about how that may differentially impact someone who first experiences trauma later in life. And it's also important to realize that not not everyone experiences trauma in the same way. So you can have, uh, for example, a family of individuals who are in the same um, house experiencing the same day-to-day -day traumas, and every person in that house may experience the trauma in a different way. They may have um, developed their own sense of how they're going to cope with that trauma. Um, and for some, they may have few symptoms or no lingering symptoms of the trauma and for many their symptoms of the trauma are going to be uh, fairly severe so again you know uh, we can't look at a specific situation and a specific context and think that it's going to be um, experienced the same way by everyone who is in that situation or context what is clear from what we know is that individuals who experience repeated chronic or multiple traumas are much more likely to exhibit more pronounced symptoms of that trauma. And these could include things like substance use disorders, mental health problems, health problems, and or physical manifestations of the trauma, and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we also know is that these ongoing experiences of trauma, um, often again known as historical trauma or intergenerational trauma, can not only overwhelm an individual, but it also can overwhelm a community's resources to cope. You know, so often um, communities that have a history of trauma, individuals who have a history of trauma, we see things like heightened fear response, you know, that, um, you know, uh, they, um, uh, when something happens, they're um, thinking of it potentially resulting in something negative um sort of goes off and this honestly can be seen in some respects as an adaptive way of coping because if your community if you as an individual has had so many negative and traumatic things happen to you then your, your likelihood to fear more trauma in the future or to expect bad things to happen to you um, is rooted in all those negative behaviors. And we see that manifest all the time in research where individuals are have a serious mistrust of governmental agencies, have mistrust of researchers and institutions generally. And a lot of this trust is rooted in um, historical experiences that these communities have had uh, with these institutions. Um, so the really the onus is on us to show that we are trustworthy and not to wonder why people are so um, mistrustful because I think that it's pretty clear why people can be incredibly uh, have huge mistrust of um, organizations and institutions. Uh, one of the things that often happens um, with a fear response is it ignites individuals sort of sympathetic nervous system, which, you know, it is often referred to as that sort of flight, uh, fight or freeze reaction. So um, some individuals may freeze, may not know you know, in the moment, be very overwhelmed and not able to do anything. For other individuals, um, that could look like, you know, fighting and aggression um, or hostility. And for other individuals, it could look like um, fleeing or isolating oneself or um, distancing oneself from a situation or uh, people or circumstances and so forth. But I think what is incredibly important to know about trauma 
is that for many, it produces this sense of fear and vulnerability and helplessness. And that can manifest itself in any number of ways. Um, but uh, this is a pervasive, um, you know, underlying um, component of the experiences of trauma. And the more trauma that one experiences, the more likely you are to see sort of this sense of fear and vulnerability and helplessness. And I think it's really important to realize that the event itself and the individual's experience of that event is what determines whether something is traumatic. You know, so all of us could experience the same event but it really is how we each experience that event which will determine whether or not it's traumatic and that is really really key and um <clears throat> to really give you a sense of how historical trauma sort of plays out in this greater landscape of trauma i think it's important to just give a, a high level overview of what trauma can mean for individuals, for families and communities who have sort of a legacy of trauma. So historical trauma, as I indicated earlier, is a, a set of events that is embodied or held personally and passed down over generations. And his, historical trauma was first um, identified among Native researchers, but of course it did not go really mainstream until um, researchers in the 60s uh, who were in Manhattan were identifying this group of individuals who were pre presenting to their um, clinical practices with trauma and traumatic symptom, or not trauma, excuse me, but traumatic um, symptomology. And none of these individuals had actually experienced a trauma that these psychologists could pinpoint, but yet they were showing up in their offices with some pretty severe traumatic symptomology. And what they found is that these individuals who were seeking therapy in Manhattan, and they were in their 30s, uh, late 20s, 30s at the time, were the offspring of Holocaust survivors. So their parents had been and had a lived experience of being in concentration camps during um, the Nazi occupation of Europe. And that their experience in the concentration camps, that trauma that they had experienced had been passed down to their children. And so what those early um, research studies showed is that the passing down of trauma through generations can result in something that is called, or something that has been termed heightened stress vulnerability. So heightened stress vulnerability is exactly what it sounds like. And that's basically like if you are confronted with a stressor and all of us are stressed out, maybe now um, in this <laughs> uh, current atmosphere more than we generally are. And if you have a history of trauma that has been passed down from generations to generation, that may predispose you and your larger community to this heightened stress vulnerability so that whenever new stressors come, it taxes your ability to effectively cope with those stressors. Also, what we found in recent studies is that um, it, a mother who is experiencing stress during pregnancy um, and uh, uh, throughout, it doesn't even have to be throughout the pregnancy, it can be like one point in time during the pregnancy, that her offspring will have changes at the genetic level. So at the cellular level, there will be changes in the offspring of a mother who experiences stress during pregnancy. And um, the latest uh, 
data on this was Yehuda and her colleagues who did a study in New York City after the um, Twin Towers were attacked and they followed mothers who were in their third trimester of pregnancy uh, when the trade centers were attacked and um, studied them and their offspring. And what they found was that this, these changes that happen as a result of maternal stress and stress during pregnancy can lead to biological changes in the child that predispose children to negative health outcomes. And then if you look at some of the negative health outcomes in children of communities with legacies of historical trauma, particularly our indigenous brothers and sisters, African-American and Latinx brothers and sisters, you see the same sort of um, uh, predispositions to these negative health outcomes. So there's really um, a lot of evidence that shows that biological and psychological expressions of historical trauma are definitely contributors to some of the health disparities that we see, particularly the disparities that we see in the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, and so forth. So, and if any of you are interested in reading more about this, I have like a whole laundry list of um, uh, resources at the bottom here that you could read more about this. And I think it's really critical to note that these impacts don't just, um, you know, affect the individual, you know, that we see these impacts, the disruption on the way of life, the disruption on culture that these, the, this legacy of trauma creates at the family level and the community level, you know, and for many of these um, or groups that are much more communal than individualistic, this has very, very far-reaching implications for the health and well-being of um, these communities. So I just want to talk a little bit about what trauma looks like, um, trauma symptomology, what it looks like uh, for an individual. Um, so for individuals, and again, remember that your experience of, of trauma symptomology is really going to be driven by not only the event, but how you experience that event. And so for individuals, trauma symptomology could look like chronic stress. So the person is uh, under stress all the time. And as um, you know, this could be tied to the heightened stress vulnerability that we talked about before, particularly for people from communities who have um, legacies of trauma. We can see internalized antagonism. In this case, I have here internalized transgender antagonism that could, that could be um, you know, uh, replaced with internalized um, homophobia, internalized racism, uh, internalized, um, you know, the, the list goes on and on. But basically some, someone internalizes the negative um, and hostile and devout or invalidating communication that they hear and um, experience of their group and own that for themselves. It could also lead to a, a loss of sense of purpose. Uh, relationship strains uh, could limit someone's expectations of themselves and others. Um, as I stated before, it could um, uh, result in negative health outcomes. And I mentioned that the negative health outcomes that have been directly tied to experiences of trauma and stress are cardiovascular, respiratory, autoimmune, and so forth. Um, as I mentioned before, it could lead to catastrophic expectancy. So you just expect things to go wrong for you. You expect the world to be an awful place. You expect people to be mean or rude or obnoxious, whatever the case may be. Um, and then for many, it also impacts their worldview, where the world is not a safe place. 
and it's actually an unsafe place. Probably one of the best examples that I've seen of this worldview is uh, Laverne Cox um, uh, gave a speech, uh, it was like a 10 minute speech about her experience as a black woman of a transgender experience. And um, you know, she was walking down her street in Brooklyn, New York in the middle of the day and um, someone spit in her face and no one on the street said anything. They just watched it happen. No one voiced their outrage. And so for days and weeks and months and um, you know, still lingering to this day, she has a certain level of fear in leaving her house and walking down the street of will she be attacked? Will anyone, um, you know, do anything to protect her. So how safe is the world for people who, who have, you know, unchecked violence and abuse uh, on the daily? And, and I think I, you know, I, I bring this out because often when people present with these traumatic um, symptoms, uh, they're all often further pathologized. So instead of seeing how this unsafe view may have, you know, been formulated and uh, what events are actually supporting this worldview as unsafe, we often pathologize the individual and, you know, and say, well, you know, they, they have a problem. They don't see the world as safe or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, they have a sense of for, a force shortened sense of the future, which is um, something that um, has been documented over and over again in Native youth, in African American and Latinx youth, where they don't see themselves living, you know, for very long. And, you know, given what's going on in their communities and around them, you know, how much is this based in reality, you know, and how much do we pathologize individuals instead of looking at the context and the um, environment that may be um, implicated in some of these traumatic symptomologies? Uh, also, uh, symptoms of PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, people may experience survivor guilt, um, anxiety, anger, grief, depressive symptomology. And I think it's really important to think about depressive symptomology because one of the things that people often don't realize in depression is, you know, we think that depression means that someone is sad and they're, um, you know, they um, are showing sort of a deflated affect. And often depression can manifest itself as anger for individuals, particularly individuals who have a legacy of trauma. And their depression is often missed because we see them as angry or difficult or challenging, and therefore they don't get the uh, interventions that they need. And again, are further pathologized because we aren't recognizing their anger as a potential symptom of depression. Um, so I think that's really important to think about uh, as well. We also see impaired communication uh, where individuals, um, you know, may be quick to confrontation, may be defensive, may, um, you know, uh, speak at an elevated level because of the way that they've been communicated to or the way that they have learned to communicate and what has been effective for them in the past. Another thing that we often don't think about with trauma is that, you know, many of us have not had a, um, a formalized coping class. <laughs> you know, if you um, think about how you learned how to cope and some of you may be fortunate enough to have been able to take some coping classes or, um, you know, some um, stress management classes. But for most of us, uh, we learn how to cope 
from looking at how our parents coped. And if your parents uh, learned how to cope from their parents who learned how to cope from their parents and you come from a community where there is a legacy of trauma and that trauma may be addressed for some people but may not even be acknowledged or noticed or addressed in others, that is where you're gonna learn how to cope. And so often many of us will implement coping strategies that might work in the short term, but may not work in the long term and may not work across all situations. So often we may learn how to communicate in a certain fashion because it works in a certain situation, but it may not work in other situations. The same is true for substance abuse. You know, no one starts out using substances because they want to have a substance use problem. For many people who start out using substances, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel better about themselves, about situations. It might give them a sense of euphoria when nothing else has made them feel good. So, and then eventually at some point, um, if misuse becomes the norm, then that is no longer an effective way of coping. But again, we pathologize often substance users um, and the misuse of substances uh, further uh, traumatizing individuals whose substance use is no longer working for them. And one of the other things we see is exaggerated personal attachments um, or independence. So this could you know, run the gamut where on one end, uh, you see someone who consistently gets into um, dysfunctional relationships, doesn't see red flags, um, you know, or, um, you know, makes excuses or um, uh, doesn't necessarily see some of the disruption, disruptive behaviors in relationships. Uh, and then on the very other extreme of that, you see people who will isolate themselves away from everyone and really um, just put themselves in a cocoon and not really have any personal connections. And there's a lot in between, obviously. Those are the two extremes. Um, you also see impaired self-esteem. So that's how someone sees themselves, their self-worth. You know, how much, you know, how much am I worth investing in? How much am I worth, um, you know, um, give, you know, giving my all for this intervention. You know, if you don't think that you are worth much, that's going to uh, trickle down into the behaviors that you engage in and so forth. So self-esteem is incredibly important. And we also, um, in some instances, see emotional dysregulation. Um, and emotional dysregulation uh, can be really challenging for an individual to work through because they have a hard time regulating their emotions. So that could be quick to anger, quick to tears, um, quick to, um, you know, uh, frustration or um, mistrust and so forth. So I think, you know, it's really important to understand that someone who is experiencing trauma may not experience any of these symptoms and others may be experiencing a ton of these symptoms at any given time which makes it incredibly challenging to manage um you know one's quality of life when you um might be dealing with an onslaught of all of these various um trauma symptomologies at the family level, we see impairments in communication and stress around parenting, you know, and then all of the individual level stuff that I just outlined is also impacting the family dynamic, you know, and give, given the structure and composition of families, uh, if you are in a family where they're dealing with their own individual traumas, have a legacy of historical trauma that is impacting each one of those individuals and then impacting the family level, 
you know, there may be a lot going on and a lot that um, people have to uh, work with um, and try to manage. And the same is true at the community level. And there have been a lot of really, really amazing um, articles that have come out by some of the individuals here in the Pacific Northwest, Bonnie Duran and Karina Walters, who are at the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the UW, have written a lot about how trauma breaks down community and values for Native and Indigenous individuals, um, how it can uh, lead to high rates of substance use, including alcohol use as a coping mechanism. And then again, you know, that may work initially, but it doesn't work in the long run. Um, we've also seen um, tons of um, literature that shows how stress can impact uh, physical outcomes, physical health outcomes, mental health outcomes, or feelings of ourself in, ter in terms of internalizing some of the negative um, uh, messages that we receive based on our devalued identities and also catastrophic expectancies, which I talked about a little before. Um, and again, um, a person's response to trauma is also influenced by many, many different things. So as I indicated, you know, symptomology can be very different, but the way we respond to a trauma, you know, can really um, have an impact on how serious our symptoms are, you know. So, you know, was the trauma an individual trauma or was it a group trauma or a community-based trauma? That will, you know, definitely have an impact on how we respond to the trauma. Uh, our own individual attributes, you know, um, how mm. good is our resiliency, which I'll talk about later, you know, how much of the different factors do each one of us have that helps promote resiliency? Um, how um, well versed are we in coping with stress, in managing um, stressful situations? Um, you know, the developmental factors, you know, how healthy are we just generally with our own mental health and our own physiological health? Or have we had so many hits and blows already that we're compromised in our physical health? Like we have pre existing conditions that could be, um, you know, exacerbated by a trauma or a stressor. You know, our life history, you know, and again, uh, you know, did we have an early early trauma that started in childhood, which is generally the case for um, many people with devalued identities. And then the type of trauma, you know, how, um, how impactful was the episode, how violent was the episode and so forth. And, the, and that sort of goes hand in hand with the specific characteristics of the trauma. And I think the next one is really important, you know, how long and what length of time were we exposed to this trauma? You know, I mean, if you look at the study that Yehuda and colleagues did in um, New York City after the trade centers, you know, we're talking about a day um, of attacks on the trade center. That's the actual event. But then all of the fallout from that, the news afterwards, the um, experiences of um, New York in terms of the air quality and um, the general heightened fear state, um, you know, so all of those things are going to impact your responses to the trauma. And then what cultural meaning does your community, your family give to trauma, you know, well, the trauma is going to be experienced much, much differently if it's something that people can point out, can talk through, can um, sort of, uh, you know, name as opposed to, you know, a community or a family where the trauma is ignored and um, no one is to speak about it. And, you know, if you bring this up, this could potentially shame you and your family. Very, very different experiences 
uh, of the trauma, which will lead to very, very different responses to that trauma as well. And then other things that might impact responses to the trauma are the number of losses that you had, real and perceived losses from the trauma, the available resources that you and your community have to deal with those traumas. Um, and for many communities with de devalued identities, those devalued identities go hand in hand with a lack of viable resources to be able to cope with traumas as they arise. And then the community reactions to the trauma, which I've sort of talked about uh, before. All of these things are going to impact your response, your family's response and your community's response to the trauma. Now I wanna just take a little bit of time to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder because when we talk about uh, trauma symptomology, I think it's really important to understand at least what we're talking about when we talk about PTSD. And PTSD is basically um, a, uh, a diagnosis that uh, is written up in um, uh, you know, psychological text, and it has four specific symptom clusters. Um, the first one is sort of like intrusion and re-experiencing. This is, uh, many people know this as flashbacks, um, you know, and it's these re-experiencing and intrusive thoughts can be so severe that it's like you are back in the situation, the traumatic situation, and it can feel incredibly real to individuals. Um, and these intrusive thoughts or flashbacks or nightmares um, can be persistently re-experienced um, over a period of time and, and they could be, um, you know, uh, cued by certain places or certain people. And because of that, another symptom that often comes with PTSD is avoidance. So in order to um, not have these flashbacks or not sort of experience these extreme re-experiencing of the trauma, individuals might avoid certain places, certain people, certain food, things that remind them of the trauma, you know, and this could be, you know, as, uh, you know, as, as, as mild as like avoiding a certain street or it could be as severe as just avoiding people generally where you don't leave your house or, and, and so forth. So each of these, you know, there, there is a range in the experiences of these symptoms. Um, you also see negative changes in mood or um, your ability to think or remember um, or, you know, organize your thoughts. Um, and we can also see negative changes in arousal and reactivity. So uh, for some people, you might see heightened arousal, you know, almost sort of like manic or hyperactive. And for others, um, you may see like more sleeping, uh, more being checked out, uh, more lethargy and so forth. So these are really the four symptom um, clusters for a PTSD diagnosis um, and, and you know many people who are walking around with um, lots of trauma symptomology have never been diagnosed with PTSD um, and and so I think that's really important to note that there are many um, individuals who certainly are experiencing uh, pretty severe uh, trauma symptomology um, who may not have ever received a PTSD diagnosis. And the other is true as well. I've met people who have a PTSD diagnosis and they aren't exhibiting any trauma symptomology, although they have experienced a trauma um, and the symptomology from that trauma is, has not been severe, nor was it ever. And again, that goes back to the fact that each of us will experience a trauma very differently. And for some, we may have no symptoms and for others, we may have tons of symptoms. And I think it's really important to note that, you know, for the folks who've been doing work with um, 
uh, childhood abuse and development that these adverse childhood experiences, uh, something called ACEs, are or, um, something that is talked about quite a bit uh, across uh, developmental and medical um, uh, disciplines, you know, and it is well established that adverse childhood events um, can have impacts across a range of developmental um, uh, criteria. And for many individuals, these early adverse childhood experiences can often result in early death. And I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise given what I've just talked about, that trauma is very, very closely related to not only mental health outcomes, but physiological outcomes as well. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in HIV, you know, and fortunately NASDAD finally published this in 2014, but for those of us who've been working working in HIV for many decades, uh, we can tell you without a doubt that all of these devalued identities that place people at heightened risk for traumatic experiences impact a person's ability to traverse the HIV continuum of care. So, you know, it impacts not only whether you're diagnosed with HIV, but also whether you are at the other end virally suppressed, you know, and individuals who um, are much more likely to have experienced traumatic events in their lives uh, fall out along every category in this um, HIV continuum of care. And uh, one could probably put diabetes up here. Uh, a cardiovascular disease up here, um, some respiratory um, issues uh, like asthma, for example, and see some very similar um, results because HIV is not in a vacuum with regard to how trauma and devalued identities play out for a lot of people. So I've given you um, a very, very, very you know, a high level overview of trauma. Hopefully um, I've given you enough so that you can understand um, what trauma is and, and how it manifests itself across individuals, families, and communities. And I wanna give a little bit of time talking about resilience. And I think it's really critical um, from a social justice point of view to point out that while it is incredibly important for individuals to successfully adapt to all of the traumas and the stressors around them, it is also equally important that those of us who are involved in this work, work to change the structures and the systems that continue to oppress people with devalued identities. It's not enough to simply help people be resilient. Uh, people must be resilient because the systems and structures that are in place are going to take a long time, um, hopefully not too long to dismantle. But and in the meantime, people, you know, we, we have to be resilient. Um, and I think, you know, the onus is on all of us who do this work to, to be able to change some of the systems and structures that uh, rely on people to be resilient so that they can successfully traverse these adverse conditions and be able to cope with the stressors. So what do we know about resilience? You know, what does it take for people to be able to effectively traverse traumatic experiences, uh, to deal with stress as it comes up and to effectively get through adverse conditions? Uh, and the, the first one is social support. And you can see here on this um, slide, I have a picture of the house ball community, which is a major source of social support for black and Latinx, transgender and um, gay uh, or gay identified um, individuals um, in the US and um, 
I think possibly even abroad, but definitely in the US. And I, social support is incredibly, incredibly key. And often when we talk about social support, we just think of emotional support, you know, someone who can listen to us, you know, and really um, help us get through different situations. But social support also is about informational support, you know, or do you have someone who's going to give you the information that you need to make decisions to um, find a medical uh, professional who is transgender competent to find um, social services that understand um, what it is like to be an undocumented um, Latinx in this country. Um, so it's incredibly important to have that informational support and people who will help you navigate the systems. It's also equal, just as equally important to have tangible support. You know, if you don't have money to pay your electric bill, is there someone that you can go to that's not going to mean that you incur some major penalty to borrow money for the short, short term? Someone who can pick up your kids in an emergency, someone who can help you if you're in, you know, if your health is failing or you are ill for any amount of time. These are all equally important. And often when we talk about social support, we only think about the emotional component of social support, but the tangible or the tangible and the informational and the navigational aspects of social support are just as important. Also, self-efficacy is incredibly important. And this is sort of the sense of control that one has over their life. And self-efficacy, I'll talk about self-esteem a little later, but self-efficacy is very different than self-esteem. Self-efficacy requires that someone feel that they have control over their circumstances and the capability and the capacity to get things done on their own. You know, and one of the um, points that always came up when I was working in um, uh, community counseling and mediation, the CBO in, in um, New York City was, you know, how much do we actually do for our clients and how much do we present the information and provide choices and provide resources so that an individual can do what they need to do and have the resources to do it and we're not doing it for them. And I think that that is a critical component to think about in service delivery across a wide range of um, services because it, the, the onus really is on providing capacity and support so that people have control over their, what they can do and the circumstances of their life. And I think that is very, very critical in terms of um, building resilience and building um, an individual's capacity. Um, Self-esteem, as I mentioned before, is one's overall evaluation of their worth. And there are people who have been told by uh, individuals in their lives who were, you know, to care for them and to um, lift them up that they are not worth anything. And there are m many people that I've encountered who don't have a great sense of worth and actually don't think that they're worth very much. So if you are not worth fighting for and you are not you know worth um you know the extra effort how much effort are you actually gonna give in you know improving your situation improving um the things around you or um taking control over a situation you know if you believe that you don't have a voice or you don't have the power um you know, the most effective way to take someone's power away from them is by making them think that they have no power. That's a, a paraphrasing of an Alice Walker statement, one of my favorites. Um, and that go gets directly to self-esteem and making sure that people have very good self-esteem 
and a sense of their own worth. And then also trust and empowerment. You know, these, this is the last sort of component of resilience. And this is really about community pride and community organizing and getting resources to the individuals and families and communities that need them. And this could include like consciousness raising activities, um, you know, building relationships between institutions to increase trust and, um, you know, to increase community capacity, all of those things. And the, and many would argue that in, for communities and families and for individuals to um, really be resilient in the face of the many social and structural factors that disproportionately impact them, that all of these components of resilience need to be focused on you know, that there's not just one, but all that are required in ensuring that individuals, families, and communities have the resources and the capacity that they need to be resilient. Um, so that sort of leads us then into trauma-informed care. You know, part of trauma-informed care is really understanding understanding trauma, understanding how it manifests itself, and understanding how people might um, implement certain strategies to, um, you know, to successfully navigate traumas in their life. So SAMHSA, again, I think provides the best definition of trauma-informed care that I've seen. And they define it. And again, this is on their website and they have a trauma-informed care um, uh, curriculum that I think is really easy to understand and very um, uh, much lays out what you need to do, uh, not only as an individual, but an organization to be more trauma-informed and to infuse trauma-informed care into your setting, uh, your workplace, and just your general approach to life. So SAMHSA defines uh, trauma-informed care as a pro program, organization, or system that realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands potential paths for healing, recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in their staff and their clients. So that means that you have to recognize that there are many people on your staff who are dealing with trauma and who have been traumatized and for whom some of our actions and our procedures and processes may be re-traumatizing. And I think that is a critical component that it's not just about our clients, our patients, our participants, it is also about our staff and anyone else who's involved in the system. And after you have sort of recognized and educated yourself on trauma and the potential paths of healing, what is equally important is that to identify processes, policies, rules, and regulations that you might be able to um, change or implement that fully integrate your knowledge about trauma. And that is really key. You know, what processes do you have in place that may be re-traumatizing, you know, that you need to maybe tweak a little bit or to change or, or revisit. Um, and so I want to just spend the last a uh, couple minutes of the presentation talking about what that might look like for you as an individual as you try to be more trauma-informed care or trauma-informed in the work that you do and what that might mean for your larger institution. So I think first it's really important to understand why being trauma-informed is important. Uh, regardless of what you do and what your role is, you are employed and you are the provider of services. Those two things give you not only power, but privilege. 
and there is a power dynamic in any relationship that you might go into with someone who is seeking services, seeking support, or needing, you know, some of the resources or information that you might have. So recognizing the power dynamic in the relationship and what your power and privilege is in that relationship and how you might be able to utilize that power and privilege to, um, um, you know, change the dynamics of the relationship. In many instances, when our um, patients or um, clients come in to see us, we ask them for information. I mean, in HIV, this might we might be the ones who ask people for the most intimate information in record time. You know, you come in 15 minutes later, we're asking you about insertive anal sex, uh, receptive anal sex, and so forth. I mean, there's a huge lack of privacy um, in some of the questions that we ask and sometimes these questions are asked in the absence of any real relationship building or rapport building and that is really critical and can re-traumatize individuals and you know one of the things that um, I've been incredibly um, uh, vocal about is people having to come in and tell their stories over and over again to get services um, you know and how that places people in a situation that could be very re-traumatizing because they're telling you the same story over and over again just to get services. Um, and so how, how might we make that a little less traumatizing? How can we integrate services across different institutions so that someone doesn't have to retell their story over and over again? Another thing that individuals face um, in receiving services and um, you know accessing resources is changes in their providers and often providers or can change with little or no no um, notice and for individuals who have um, loss as trauma and many individuals do I mean if particularly if you're watching. Um, what's going on around us, you know that people of color are no strangers to loss of family members and sometimes violently. So any other loss experienced could um, re-traumatize individuals. So I think, you know, and there are uh, certainly other things that can be traumatizing, but these are sort of the high level things that I think we can do better in terms of how we uh, respond to changes in staff and how we communicate that to our um, uh, clients or our patients, I think is really, really critical to um, reduce the re-traumatization that might result from these experiences. And then, you know, for those of you who are working in medical institutions, you know, uh, some of the procedures that we have are incredibly invasive. Um, some of the procedures are based on sex assigned at birth and not current gender identity. Um, so individuals who um, have a gender identity that is not congruent with the sex that they were assigned at birth are often asked to take tests and to undergo procedures that are not based on their physical anatomy, which can be incredibly re-traumatizing, particularly for a group of individuals who um, experience a lot of violence and victimization uh, in all facets of life, including in medical settings. Um, we generally ask people to remove their clothing um, depending on the procedure in medical facilities and the way that that is negotiated may have huge implications for the re-traumatization of people who have a history of sexual assault or violence and sexual violence uh, or even physical violence. Um, the per again, as I talked about previously, asking incredibly personal questions in the absence of a relationship or any real effort to build a relationship can be re-traumatizing. Uh, the gender of a provider 
uh, can be traumatizing in some instances for individuals who've had a male or female perpetrator in their lives. Um, so, you know, ins ensuring that we understand where people's traumas are rooted and how um, the gender of a provider may or may not re-traumatize an individual and help having um, processes and procedures in place to um, work through that. And again, um, as I stated before, you know, just having procedures that don't make any sense, you know, based on sex assigned at birth or and not based on organs, um, you know, uh, requiring something that um, a person has to pay for out of pocket that may not be necessary that could then place them in uh, a precarious financial situation, which could be re-traumatizing and um, so forth. And there are lots of articles um, and SAMHSA, again, is an incredible resource for trying to identify how some of the rules and the policies and procedures that you have in place might be re-traumatizing to people who um, have experienced trauma. So, how do we then, once we identify how some of our procedures and policies might be traumatizing, you know, how might we start this trauma-informed care process at our institutions and in our organizations? The first is really to attend to the issues of power and hierarchy. Again, you know, relationship building is very good for this and ensuring that, um, you know, individuals are building relationships and building trusting relationships and ensuring that clients and um, patients are given autonomy and a sense of self-efficacy that they have choices to choose from and that you're giving them the full information so that they can make an informed choice, an informed decision. Uh, you know, and again, it goes back to the empowerment and the trust building. And, you know, also understanding the effects of violence and abuse on a person's life and development. The more you can understand how violence and abuse may manifest itself in trauma symptomology and understanding, you know, how um, that can impact someone's communication and how it can impact their um, relationships, um, how it can impact their behavior. And again, recognizing that depression often can manifest itself as anger in individuals, incredibly, incredibly important. So the more you can understand the effects of violence and abuse, the more trauma-informed you will be. And also, I think many of us, myself included, we have been educated uh, from a disease model perspective. So we figure out what's wrong and we try to fix it. Whereas trauma-informed care asks you to sort of flip the script a little bit. It asks you to look at people based on their strengths. So not what's wrong with them, but what are the strengths? What are they bringing to the table? Because everyone has strengths. And so how do we identify those strengths and figure out ways to lift them up and to help those individuals really tap into those strengths to be able to access the services they, they need, to be able to improve their own quality of life, their own um, health and well being. You know, so this strength based model also works to foster growth and it recognizes and promotes resiliency, which I talked about before. And remember, resiliency is not only about social support and the various levels of social support, but it's also about building self-efficacy, building self-esteem, and then activities to promote trust and empowerment, all from a strengths-based perspective, which is somewhat, um, you know, antithetical to what all of us have been taught, you know, that we figure out what's wrong and we try to fix it. You know, we either try to cure it, we try to prevent it, or we try to treat it. And this requires us to really look at the strengths and how we promote and foster those strengths. And 
it also acknowledges that many of the behaviors that we have traditionally pathologized are really people's attempts to cope and that many of us don't know how to effectively cope. And in the absence of knowing how to effectively cope, we do what we know, you know, to try to cope. How are the people around us coping? What makes me feel good when I can't make myself feel good? And some of those things we have seen and have historically characterized as, um, you know, criminal or, um, or bad or, you know, whatever other negative word you want to give to them. So instead of stepping back and seeing what people may be doing to cope, that isn't working for them. These coping skills are not working for them, but they are doing something to try to cope with their situation. And how might we turn those destructive and negative ways of coping into something that is more, uh, that results in better quality of life, that results in better health outcomes, both physiological and mental health outcomes without further pathologizing the person and building on their strengths and not pathologizing things that are characterized as weaknesses. And I think that that is key. And part of that again is increasing access to choices options resources you know people need resources and capacity to have a sense of control over their life decisions to be able to effectively um mitigate some of the challenges that they face day to day you know challenges that uh, other people don't have to face um you know and uh, for whom, uh, you know, they may not even be aware of the layers of challenges that are many people's realities. And part of this acknowledges that people who have histories of trauma are much more likely to experience particular treatment procedures and practices as negative, you know. Um, and again, the more you can understand how trauma manifests itself and how certain procedures and practices can be experienced as traumatizing, the more we can do to try to ensure that what we are asking of people in our organizations and our um, institutions doesn't further re-traumatize individuals. And finally, a trauma-informed care perspective you know, takes this larger view that trauma-related symptoms and behaviors are an individual's best and most resilient attempt to manage, cope with, and rise above experiences of trauma. And I think that that is key. You know, so for so long, we have blamed the victim. And there is a long history of blaming the victim in the US culture. Race-based science is based squarely in this idea of blaming the victim. It is your fault that X, Y, and Z is happening. So instead of focusing on the systemic and structural issues that place people in these precarious situations and focusing on our energy on mitigating the challenges that are created by these systems and structures, we have engaged in a discourse that squarely places the onus and the blame on the victim. So that system is incredibly broken, particularly for people who have these histories of traumas. So trauma-informed care is one way to try to fix that broken system. So how might you get started in a trauma-informed care approach? So every member of your clinic has to participate in one or more trainings. This is, this is your first one, but this is by no means extensive and exhaustive. This is a very high-level overview and should not, I think, be seen as you know, a trauma-informed care 
um, session that's going to set you up. There's certainly more training that um, could help you better implement um, a trauma-informed care approach. And then the other thing is developing the skills to communicate more effectively with patients and each other. And I can say, you know, as myself, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, you know, I certainly was born into a situation where trauma was the norm. I had to learn how to communicate not only for myself, but also how to communicate more effectively with the individuals that I have um, put myself in a position where I am there to serve them, to offer resources. Um, so many of us don't know how to communicate and um, have actually learned how to communicate in very um, defensive or, um, or uh, uh, aggressive ways, I'll just put it that way. So it really takes a lot of skill to communicate, particularly if you think about how trauma can manifest itself, you know, in terms of the way people communicate, the way they engage in relationships, um, emotion, uh, dysregulation, uh, anger, withdrawal, all of these things require someone who can really communicate with individuals and to be um, a more effective and trauma-informed communication is key. Also identifying a champion, you know, in my workplace, I am our trauma-informed care champion. That person brings training in and ensures that everyone um, is, has a clear understanding of how trauma manifests itself. Uh, we work to identify ways that we can reduce um, procedures and practices that could be traumatizing. And so the, the clinic champion really moves the work forward and really makes sure that um, what needs to be done to realize a trauma-informed care um, environment is being done. And then the other thing is making partnerships with local trauma and service organizations. Um, often some of the needs of uh, participants who or clients or uh, patients who are experiencing acute traumas uh, requires more than um, your agency can offer and links to uh, tr services that have a long-standing history of um, working with people who are traumatized and mitigating the challenges um, that are faced by people who've experienced traumas is really, really key. And then also, you know, developing protocols for screening, um, you know, of traumas. And what's really key about that is if you are going to screen people for trauma, you must have a, a response in place. Because imagine that you are someone who is uh, the victim of trauma and people ask you about this trauma and you lay it out there and then nothing is done. There's no reaction. There's no, um, uh, you know, forward movement. Uh, you know, that may just be another um, covert or indirect way of saying that that trauma is normal because no one is reacting, no one is doing anything about it, so this must be okay. So I, you know, I think it's incredibly um, important uh, for trauma-informed care to be able to recognize people who may be um, experiencing trauma, but if you are going to ask people about their traumas, I am also, you know, a, a huge proponent in ensuring that there are services in place uh, and resources in place so that that person may be able to um, reach out and um, get some of the resources that they need um, should they um, you know, disclose their trauma to you. Um, and then finally, before I break for q and I think it's really important to look at the seven steps that SAMHSA puts forward. And again, this is part of the SAMHSA curriculum. And I think this is really, really great. This is um, their treatment improvement protocol series. Um, and they basically state that, you know, you need to create 
an environment that is trauma informed, you know, so it needs to be safe, collaborative and compassionate. You know, those, that, those are, you know, the foundations for a trauma informed environment. And in the context of that safe and collaborative and compassionate environment, you need to make sure that the treatment practices that may re-traumatize people, and I know I've said this over and over again, but it is really critical that we not re-traumatize individuals and not just treatment practices, but what are some of the microaggressions that happen in your institution? institutions and organizations that might re-traumatize people, you know, so what are some of the common ways that people can feel invalidated or that they can uh, feel put down or denigrated, you know, what communications are there, both covert and overt, that may be re-traumatizing people and um, continuing to devalue their devalued identities. I think that is really, really key and something that um, is a real challenge, honestly, um, for many organizations and institutions to really um, effectively change. But uh, starting the conversations about mi microaggressions and how different people may be experiencing microaggressions in the workplace is a great way to start identifying, um, you know, some rules and regulations of how microaggressions will be managed, how they will be reported, um, what will happen is really, really key. Um, also, building on the strengths and resilience of uh, the people in your community, not only your staff, uh, or I'm sorry, not only your clients and patients and participants, but your staff, you know, what, how do you, you build on the strengths and resilience of your staff, you know, because um, many of the people that we work with are also experiencing trauma, uh, have experienced traumas and may be dealing with traumatic symptomology. So really, really important. Um, and how do, how will you endorse trauma informed principles in your space? You know, do you need that to be part of supervision? Does it need to be some sort of support service that you set up? Um, do you need a consultant to come in to try to help you with that? Uh, perhaps um, implementation of, of the SAMHSA uh, online um, support might be good. Uh, at the very minimum, having tr uh, providers come in to train about things that we know are missing, like transcompetent care, uh, like how to um, build relationships with ethnic and racial minority um, individuals and their families uh, and understanding uh, the different nuances of, of culture and, um, and uh, community and realizing that culture and community means different things for different people, even with and racial and ethnic groups, incredibly important. Um, and as I stated before, um, starting to develop a resources and referral system is key. And some of those resources and referrals have to be um, trauma specific. Um, and, I, and I mentioned above, you know, the a clear response for reports of micro and macro aggressions for individuals in your setting. You know, any individual with a devalued identity should have a very clear sense of how micro and macro aggressions against them are going to be handled in the facility. Not only staff, or I'm sorry, not only patients and provide, or, um, uh, clients, but staff as well. That is really key. Um, so I have gone through everything um, at a very high level. Usually what I do is I have people break into groups and do an exercise, but because we are online, I think what I will do is I will stop sharing my screen and maybe we can start looking at each other and um, we can have some questions and comments. And, you know, just to be clear, um, this is an overview of trauma-informed care. So this should be seen as like, you know, step one, baby step, 
Um, and what are you going to do to move forward to learn more about trauma and its impact on um, the people who work with you and the people that we serve? So I'll take, um, I'll stop there and I will take comments, questions. Um, so thank you all for having me. I know that this is a long period of time to, to chat about this um, in this very busy season that we all seem to be in. So just to chime in, um, this is Linda. Um, do folks have um, the option to put a thumbs up or raise a hand? Okay, so if you are um, wanting to ask a question um, or make a comment, you can put up a put a thumbs up or um, raise your hand to comment, and I will unmute you. Okay, Isaac, let me unmute. Okay, you're unmuted, Isaac. Hello, hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I had a question um, regarding if you know of any resources that you could direct me towards um, in creating a response team at our organization regarding microaggressions within um, the organization itself. Um, we've been working on that um, for the last couple months um, through the DEI committee. And a lot of what we've been looking at are um, pre-existing um, systems that um, universities have created. And I wanted to know if you have any um, models for what that, um, that system could look like if, when done well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So David Williams, who has done a lot of work on uh, everyday discrimination, um, has a really good model for that. He's out of Harvard and uh, he's done a lot of work with that. So has um, uh, Daryl Sue. Uh, he has a, a microaggressions, um, you know, how to deal with microaggressions. And uh, again, his name, the, there are two brothers actually, Daryl and Stanley Sue, um, who have, you know, sort of a step-by-step -step approach of um, dealing with microaggressions. And again, it's like, you know, these are all academics. So they're do largely doing this, you know, for graduate school folks and for academia. But I do think that there are some key lessons that can go across um, institutions and organization, particularly in the work that Daryl Sue and Stanley Sue are doing. S-U-E is the last name. And then David Williams, again, he's out of um, Harvard. And if you cannot find those resources, feel free to reach out to me because I know that I have them saved as a PDF somewhere and I can find them <laughs> for you. That's so wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, and so then we had uh, Jay Hong. I'll unmute you. You still have a question. Oh, it's not unmuted. Hello, can, do you still have a question, Jay? Did you, you can unmute yourself as well, I believe. It's not working for you. Okay, we'll go to Kim Ludgreen. Did you still have a question? Forever, for whatever reason, it's not letting me unmute folks. But if you do have a question, try to unmute. Thank, thank you. I, I, I have no questions and uh, this is a very good topic and I appreciate that. Thank you, Kim. Okay, Jay, I see that you're off of mute now. So if you have a comment or question. Any other folks want to raise their, their hand or 
give me a thumbs up. Okay, hold on one second. Um, okay, um, Emmy, Yaga, Omiyaga, sorry. You can ask your question. That may have just been a hand clap. Can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> you okay, hear me? let's keep to the <laughs> hand raise or the or the thumb. I'm not saying any questions, um, okay. but we do have 20 minutes. So if there's anything that you want to kind of add on, um, or any kind of workshop questions, um, Michelle. Yeah, well, you know, I was, I was sort of uh, sharing, you know, uh, my screen before. Four. And since we have a little bit of time, I just wanted to um, maybe talk through some of um, the uh, the resiliency because I did. I think I went over that a little bit, but I thought you know that it's really important, particularly for people with devalued identities, that. Uh, you can encourage open discussion of experiences of stigma and discrimination. Um, one of the things that we have done in the School of Public Health is we have a Students of Color Affinity Group, uh, which meets um, fairly regularly, although we haven't met in a few months, but like activities like this that allow people um, with certain devalued identities to sort of get together and to share their experiences and to basically just i you know know that they're not alone and that some of the things that they're experiencing are actually quite normal and that you know many students of color are experiencing these same things i is really key and i know um that you know uh also at the hutch we have some um affinity groups that are that the um diversity um equity and inclusion folks run that are really really key and i think one one of the things that um having groups like this helps uh people work through is some of the microaggressions that they experience you know and realizing that they're not alone and being able to talk about it also impacts um, rumination. And, you know, one of the things that I've seen a lot, not only for myself personally, but in working with people as their therapist, is that, you know, uh, people with devalued identities often ruminate about the microaggressions. And it takes a lot of psychological and emotional um, time really an effort uh, around these ruminations you know things like well I wish I would have said this or I wish I wouldn't have said that or if I, I wish I could go back and do that all over again or was that person really like saying that like as a racist thing or you know am I just making too much of a big deal out of it and I mean it, the, the rumination goes on and on and on and can take up a lot of psychic energy and a lot of, um, you know, mental health and energy and really have a negative impact on people's quality of lives. And I found that, you know, these um, affinity groups, uh, you know, or, or support groups, whatever you want to call them, um, do a lot to help people with that rumination and can de decrease some of the distress that they're experiencing uh, with regard to the microaggressions that they might be, um, you know, experiencing or the stigma um, and discrimination that, you know, may, they may be experiencing out in the larger society. Um, you know, and the other thing I wanted to say about self-efficacy is that there has been a lot of uh, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that people who feel more in control of their lives, so people who are giving, given options, giving choices, are um, much more likely to engage in health affirming activities. You know, so they're much more likely to seek help and practice a lifestyle that promotes help if they have more of a sense of control over the circumstances of their life. So I think that is incredibly important. And I brought that up earlier, but I think it's worth um, noting that that is really key. Um, 
And then, you know, in terms of building trust and empowerment, some of the key things that you might um, be able to do is, you know, uh, participating in promoting building capacity, providing resources, for um, events or activities that promote racial, ethnic, community pride. Uh, it's Pride Month now. So, you know, there are many opportunities to be able to promote um, pride across the LGBTQIA diaspora. I think it's really important, um, you know, to, uh, you know, reach out, make those connections, and ensure um, that we're all doing our part for consciousness raising. Um, and that includes economic development for some of these individuals who are devalued or these communities. Um, also building op opportunities and establishing um, ways to um, build capacity in communities so that there's more resources, I think is really, really key. Um, so community building is very important and something that SAMHSA also underscores. Um, and often use, utilizing community-based participatory research models or approaches are a really great way to do this. And um, Nina Wallerstein and Bonnie Duran uh, have published a really, really great book about um, community-based participatory research. And even though, it, you know, it, it's got research in the title, I would argue that it's really a, 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 um, a nice blueprint of how to create relationships and ensure that whatever community you're working with is centered in the work um, and that you're not working on communities, but with communities and that, you know, you're focusing on issues that are pertinent for them and not just issues that you're interested in is, I, is really, really key. So th that just gives you a few ideas of um, how you might be able to promote some of these resiliency factors. Um, but there's so much literature on how to do this. And, and like I said, SAMHSA has a great tool. So uh, they can certainly give you more information if, if you are interested. And you can always also feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So if there are any other questions, I'll put myself on mute. I've got lots of people talking in my house, so sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, so th I guess this is kind of like a last call. <laughs> if you have any questions or comments, um, I will be sending you some update, I mean not updates, follow-up, um, a post evaluation that just takes five minutes and it allows us to continue to offer these kinds of trainings for free um, to the public. So it's really important that um, you make sure to uh, complete the post evaluation. And then I'll also be sending um, a link to this recording that you'll have access to for 30 days. Um, so you can go back and review and take notes and um, Michelle's information will also be in the email. So if you do happen to have questions or comments um, later, um, perhaps you can reach out to Michelle as well. Um, so I'll just give a breath for folks to see if anyone has any more comments since we have 10 minutes left. Hi, I have a question. Sorry. Yes, in the last, oh, last moment. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Michelle, uh, you know, what's happening nowadays in, you know, in the United States and also the whole world, you know, uh, and uh, I'm, a, by the way, a uh, uh, black woman and immigrant in here in the United States, and I have two, three sons. So I, you know, sometimes I struggle how to start uh, uh, to talk to them. And, and, and uh, by the way, thank you. This was very helpful. And I will be using that now. 
Uh, any, any suggestions as a parent with three uh, uh, black boys raising here? Mm. You know, that is, that is an excellent question. And um, honestly, I am uh, a parent also of two um, daughters. Um, and uh, we are, you know, one of the things that we are doing is just having open and honest conversations. Um, I think um, the most challenging part of, um, you know, being a black parent in this day and age is that, you know, my, at least for me, my two daughters are like, well, why is everyone paying attention to this now? Because it, they, they have known that, you know, there's been disproportionate police violence against black and brown bodies for a long time. Um, so it, it's almost like, well, has it gotten so much worse? And, you know, talking to them about what's happening uh, without, um, you know, creating this um, unnatural fear that all police are bad police, I think is really the, the um, fine line that we have been walking on, you know, and almost like uh, talking about um, you know, that, you know, some people are, some people might be bad, but not all people are bad. And, and what that looks like, I mean, I have a seven year old and 11 year old who have uh, responded very differently to what's going on. And my 11 year old um, is, has a lot of anxiety over police now. And so we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, uh, what this means and what the protests could mean uh, for police reform and, um, you know, also at the same time allaying her fears that she's not going to be attacked by police. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's hard when you're a parent of color because there is a lot of uh, disproportionate police activity in uh, some of our neighborhoods. So um, I've been working really hard just to allay their fears and also um, talk about what the protesters are focusing on and change and how change can come and what social justice looks like and what public health policing could look like. Um, but at the same time, like just, I listen a lot more than I talk with them just to try to understand what they're afraid of and then try to um, allay their fears, but also be realistic about the disproportionate policing in our neighborhoods. Because I also don't wanna be that parent who doesn't acknowledge that we are differentially profiled by the police because it, I mean, my children already know that. So, yeah, thank you. but it has been tough, you know, and honestly, sometimes I'll be honest, I don't know if I'm doing it the right way or not. This whole parenting thing is, uh, is an incredible challenge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, even on a good day, parenting is a challenge and then to have to uh, really have deep communication and conversation about um, things that are not right in the world and inequities and, and how to change those inequities. Um, it, it can be really challenging. Thank you. And if any other parents are on the call that have like some nuggets of wisdom, please share because I do think that this is a challenge for all of us. And, you know, I, I certainly am open to some great ideas around this as well. Well, I just want to say I'm not a parent, but um, it's also important that, you know, the white parents as well are speaking to their children about what's happening and um, making sure you're coming from an informed perspective. I mean, just like what Michelle was saying, just talking about all the different possibilities and um, trying not to be biased at how you are explaining information, but giving your kids some kind of age-appropriate history um, and also age-appropriate um, explanation around 
some of the initiatives that are happening and um, the demands of uh, a lot of the protesters um, across the country. Yeah. Arcano, did you, you came off of mute. Did you have something to say before we close out? All right, well, I'm going to um, end this.